I'll go ahead and get started. And if we don't have anybody else join, I'll try to lead by example. My name's Matt Mearsman. Hopefully most of you know me. I uh, serve as the director of the St. Oh, you know what? I'm going to start yeah. recording. Just so everybody knows, we are going to record this meeting and it'll be available for other folks down the road. So I'm in North Branch. Uh, we look at the hydraulics. So once we get the water into the channel, how's it moved through the floodplain and the floodplain sediments? Also very important in North Branch. And then how those combine to make up the geomorphology of the channel. How, how is wood distributed? How sediment distributed? What kind of features do we have? And how does this stream function overall? At the top of the pyramid, we have physical, chemical, and biological. And those are elements that we did not really focus on in this study, but we, we are providing the foundation for those. The understanding and the, the reason for the development of this pyramid was to try to understand how to look at a, at a system like a watershed, how, how to look at the overall functioning of it to see where we start working on it. If there are stressors, where do we start? Do, do we start looking at, say, for example, reintroduction of species before we understand how water is getting into the channel and what the source of that water is? Uh, and I think in my case, the quick answer to that is no. We want to understand the nature of the water. We want to understand the chemistry of it and what type of water supply we have before we start thinking about reintroducing organisms. So that's sort of how we start to put these pieces together. Uh, so in this case, we're going to focus our attention on the North Branch main stem as it comes up to the Indian Lakes chain, over through Walkettville, down through the Little Hurt Creek, out into Ool and Hutchins ditches out here in the very much headwaters. Uh, we're going to look at how water gets into this channel. We're going to look at how it moves. And then as a result of the work that we were doing up here, we're also going to take a look at Middle Branch Elkhart as well. We're going to start back here at Bixler Lake Ditch and kind of trace it up and show you and contrast a little bit of the differences between Middle Branch and North Branch. So that's the overall plan. As I said, one of the most important things we can do to start with is to understand how water is getting into the stream. And in the case of North Branch, we very quickly learned that 80 to 85% of the flow in the river and in the lakes was groundwater. Fundamentally important to understanding what to do next. Many watershed studies start looking at runoff characteristics start looking at depressional storage and different areas to do that in. In a system that is this dominated by groundwater, many of those methods, many of those techniques are gone. And the reason that they're gone is your supply of water is moving in and through these lakes, passing from lake to lake, literally through the, the river corridor. We'll take a look at the river corridor and how it's functioning. And that is forming a chain of lakes, with the river passing through them, so that the lakes are, in, in the best sense of the understanding it, the lakes are part of the river. They're, they're literally wide spots in the river in the depressions, with more steep areas having stream corridor moving through them. Understanding this tells us that this is our supply of water. So what's actually coming off of the slope in this case is minimal, very minimal, particularly when you start thinking about evapotranspiration, uh, the, the, the evaporation of water to the atmosphere, it ends up being a small number. And C of Ash is gonna look into that a little bit closer when he talks about some of the climatic changes we've been experiencing. But with that understanding in place, we wanna think ahead about how this system functions. And with an understanding that it's groundwater driven, these figures, I think, make more sense. This is a, a dominant soil parent materials map, or think surficial geology. And what you should be able to see is notice the linear trend of these lake systems. As you come down through here, they're all connected. And that's still the groundwater moving downslope under the influence of gravity, just like it was on the surface. And in these depressions in the lakes, it can well up from underneath, it can come in from the side, or it can be delivered into that lake by the river itself. That set of processes leads to rivers that respond 
quicker to changes in precipitation and climate than say a disconnected lake or a lake really without outlets and inlets. Here you have both, sometimes multiple. And so around these lakes, you can see these wide areas of gray material. And that gray material is muck. And the best way to understand it is these represent areas where water has been in the past surrounded by the bordering uplands. So looking at this map right now, you can see that the lakes are smaller than they have been in the past, in the geologic past, but they have the ability to pulse. They can expand and contract depending on the amount of water that's coming into the system. Now I'm gonna go down to a close up and kind of show you this in a little bit better way. So here, we're gonna focus right on the Eagle Island area. And you see that as we look out from that, here's the present stand of the water. You can see the river kind of moving through this way. You can see a small channel coming in here, but you can also see the connections that have existed in the past. Those persist. Those persist as low areas of muck and they're still transmitting groundwater because those muck areas tend to be saturated unless they're drained literally to the surface most of the year. Given that dynamic, you have a lake then that can easily go up and go down. And those of you that have lived in this basin for a long time know that that's happened. Uh, past concern when the DNR started working with these lakes was that the water levels were so low. Now they're to a point where they're higher than they were in recent memory, but also much lower than they have been in the past. And being higher now is not a surprise. Uh, just a little bit to the north, you've got Lake Michigan. It's also at one of its highest levels. So lake levels are rising throughout the upper Midwest because of the increase in precipitation. And that's something that Siavash is gonna talk about a lot as he gets into it. This is a, a, a difficult figure, uh, but I think it's an important one. This is a long profile. So from the, the right side all the way over here to the left, you still literally see the profile of the main stem North Branch River. As you look at this, you can see back over here, this very steep upland area coming down into flat areas where you start to see Navu, dropping down out of that, coming down into the Indian Lake system here, coming out of the Indian Lake system or Dallas Lake system in a very steep move down into the Waldron West Lake system in this flat, and then out and down into South Branch. So what you see, steeper areas, like I said, dominated by channels, flat areas dominated by lake chains. But those lake chains are storage for river water and groundwater that's passing through them. Making this a very stable system, making this a system where you don't see a lot of fluctuations in water level. Uh, you can see that at the gauge data. Uh, for a watershed of this size, the, the maximum discharge is very low. And Sea of Ash is gonna talk a lot more about that in just a minute. But this is the, the connecting corridor and it's kind of important to look at this because remember we, we wanted to see how water got into the watershed and get from the watershed into the channels. We see it's primarily groundwater. And we wanted to see how water moved through the channel. And this picture kind of shows you that better than any I can think of. This is the main stem, North Branch Elkhart River right here in the middle. Flow is away from you in this picture. This is just a little bit south of Cosperville Gauge. On either side, you see connected areas of muck. These aren't alluvial floodplains, and so these aren't floodplains that were formed by the river by depositional processes. These are our muck wetland areas that are connected to the channel, so that the channel is literally running through a string of wetlands from lake to lake. But these connected wetlands are saturated to the surface most of the year. So the water level in them can actually be as high or higher than the water in the channel, because water is also coming into the channel from the sides to those. Making it a, a, it's a, it's a fascinating system. It is, in, in my opinion, a, a beautiful system, but you can see the connectivity between this. The wetlands, 
the lakes and the river corridor are all one flow of water moving from the headwaters down the salt branch. To show you or, or tell you a little bit more about this, this extension of wetland through here, this muck floodplain, and, and it is truly a functional floodplain because as the river rises to a certain point, it will spill out into that area. So it, it serves as a floodplain function. It is a wetland. And in this case, it's about 3,000 feet wide. So over half a mile wide is a corridor of water moving through you. This part you can see easier than this part over here. So a remarkable system. Sea of Ash is going to tell you more about that. But I want to get into a couple pictures to kind of show you what we've seen. This is in the headwaters of Mainstem North Branch. So this is Hutchins Ditch looking downstream. So flow is moving away from you, from you here. Um, this is not necessarily muck here. A lot of this is a sandy loam material, which means that as water falls here, we still have a groundwater driven system. Infiltration levels are high. There is no sign of scour marks or anything on any of these slopes. Water very rarely moves from these slopes directly into the channel. Most of it's going to infiltrate before it gets to it. And in Hutchins and Ool and throughout most of the North Branch system, the ditches that you see are also very stable sided, very little erosion. And that's representative to a large degree of how the water is getting into this channel. So couldn't really ask for a better headwater system compared to what we see frequently. When Ool and Hutchins come together and start flowing towards um, Wolcottville and, and up through Cree and Tamarack and Mud and Nauvoo, they form Little Elkhart Creek. Uh, this is looking um, upstream. You can see the creek here. You can see the muck wetlands on either side. So almost immediately, we have these muck wetlands fringing it on either side, and they'll range from anywhere from 500 feet uh, collectively around that channel to over 3,000 feet as you go through this area. Little Elkhart Creek then will transition into North Branch Elkhart uh, after it comes through the Indian Lake system and as it flows downstream into the uh, West Lakes, Waldron area and Mesic Lake. Uh, in this picture you can get the same idea. So what I want to show you with this is this continuum of stable channel, very low banks, high groundwater levels, and an interaction between the groundwater and the channel from the headwaters all the way down to the confluence with South Branch. Very stable, very healthy, um, one of the best systems I've seen in the state by far. Middle Branch is not quite the same story. In Middle Branch, the headwaters, so when you look at this picture, I want you to keep in your mind what um, Hutchins and Ool look like. Hutchins and Ool are stable. Uh, the water level was higher. The vegetation was better. We didn't see the scalloping on the side down through here. And we didn't see direct stormwater inputs coming in from parking lots. So part of this has to do with it running through Kendallville. And part of it has to do with simply the way it's been drained and managed over time. Uh, these are not what we want headwaters to look like, but this is a place where there's an opportunity to do something about it. And Sea of Ash again will chat with you about that in just a second. As we move out of Kendallville, we move through a, a fairly large expanse of gravel pits. Channel has been extensively modified through them. <coughs> Excuse me. Channel's been extensively modified. You can see water level is a little bit higher. The disconnect between the, the water and the side banks, and some of this would be muck in cases, is a little bit different. It's a little higher. Uh, again, a place where we have some opportunity to improve things. Downstream from the gravel pit area, we get into Middle Branch proper. <coughs> Here is the muck wetland on this side. But here you can also see for the first time, <coughs> pardon me, for the first time you can see some incision coming along the bank. Nowhere did we see anything like this or this when we were looking at North Branch Elkhart. 
And the reason for that is this area is receiving water faster than anything in the North Branch system. That piping that's coming through Kendallville and then the gravel pit area is making water come through here faster and down cutting the channel. Something that is extremely destructive in these wetland rivers because as you drop the water level, this area quickly dries out and erodes very fast. So this is something that we would like to get stabilized as quickly as we can. That section of river comes into Sylvan Lakes and Sylvan Lakes effectively buffers everything from Kendallville and upstream uh, and serves as sort of a forebay for then the next portion of the middle branch Elkhart, which comes out of Sylvan looking very nice and looking much more like the North Branch. You can see the well-connected wetlands on either side. So flood storage is everywhere abundant through this portion, whereas in the upstream portion it's not. So very nice looking system. Um, there's a lot we have to say about how we might think about managing this, but remember that it is groundwater sourced and very much dependent on that continuity of flow between the systems. Sea of Ash, I'm gonna stop sharing if you wanna pick up. See that? There he is. And see if you are still muted, just so you know. All right, there we go. There you go. I think it's okay now. So thank you, Bob, for that uh, uh, introduction material. It's a pleasure to be again uh, here and talk about this. This graph you probably have seen uh, in the past uh, has been shown uh, in several presentations in different areas. But this basically is the latest work from uh, Purdue uh, Climate Center. Uh, and, and, and they have looked at what have been the increase in annual precipitation over the years. So this is from 1895 to 2019, almost uh, 120 years. What we have been seeing is an increase in rainfall, in annual rainfall. The, the amount varies depending on location, but still very significant in terms of uh, our area that, of interest. More important to uh, the uh, flooding in, in our areas, are the number of extreme rainfall events. Again, this is coming from Purdue study, and it shows the number of days where uh, the uh, you know, significant precipitation events occur. Uh, you can see here uh, that uh, we are seeing a, a significant increase in those numbers, particularly this last you know, uh, 20 years or so, we are seeing, you know, a, a, a number of events happening a lot more. So we are seeing much more significant events, and much more frequently the same events. Uh, looking at the, the, the basically result of the rainfall in, in different watersheds, we look at the flow uh, values. And we do have a gauge at Cusperville, which basically, you know, pretty much downstream of, of uh, 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 Westlake system, so it's kind of an outlet, you know, almost outlet of the system. And, and here we see the, the peak annual flow rates uh, uh, depicted here, again, from 1971 all the way to 2019. And what we see here is, first of all, that we have had several peaks uh, annual rates in the past, and and the, the, the orange color is a 10-year moving average. Generally, you know, maybe some increase in the, in the past, but it's not as significant. Again, if I showed you uh, some of these graphs for other streams in the area, like in the Kankakee River, for instance, uh, you're going to see this very increasing, uh, uh, basically, nature of, of, the, of the stream, uh, very increasing uh, uh, kind of a trend in, in that area. Uh, as we look at another indicator, uh, is our daily flow volumes. And, and these are like an average daily flows. And so if you, you uh, 
basically put that together in a year time, we plotting this average daily volume of flow coming in into the system, passing through cost per well. And, and here we see really a significant uh, importance of a significant importance uh, uh, graph. And it shows that basically the flow volumes are not necessarily increasing as one would expect as rainfall increases. This uh, has uh, let me just bring the laser pointer out and so you can show it better. So you can see that this is pretty much remaining almost the same. Again, you know, has been uh, many years with the large average daily flow volumes, but, but the trend is not directed. Again, if I looked at other systems, you know, Mami areas or St. Mary's, or if you look at Kankakee, instead of having this type of thing, we are seeing this kind of a increase here. And the question becomes then, why are we not seeing this increases uh, in the end of the system? And that what Bob and I always uh, uh, you know, talk about is, is the definition of resiliency. That means this system is very resilient. How is it resilient? Because it had so much storage in the system. The, the storage, flood storage, which is system is in the form of the lakes. Uh, and as Bob pointed out, in the form of all those muck areas that are surrounding those lakes. So in here, while we're showing just a, a foot of uh, uh, lake levels, those main uh, four lake, level, lake systems in the area, not all of them, but the four main ones, uh, you are really looking at tremendous amount of uh, uh, storage uh, in the system. And this is just, uh, in, in just one foot of storage and it does not include all those mock areas. So what is the role of this type of a uh, storage system is to dampen uh, those uh, and absorb that increase in, in rainfall. And so uh, on one hand, we're saying this is an excellent re resilient system because it can absorb that. But the question is that when we say absorbing, where is this absorbed? So here's another graph to show you in terms of the surface runoff uh, as it comes through, how is it changing along along the way. So we're looking at the Oliver Lake system, for instance, the, what you see here is the flow values coming in and going out of the system, theoretically based on our simulation of, of what's happening. So this is, a, I believe, a five-year uh, flow system. The hydrograph, uh, the dashed lines here show the flow that's getting in to the system uh, of those lakes, and this is what leaves that. And you can see that there is definitely a uh, reduction of the flow going on, uh, going downstream, and that is because the rest, this amount of the uh, uh, difference between these two hydrographs being stored in the, these lake systems, in the, in the storage system. As you come downstream, you can see those peaks are getting larger, uh, but still we are gonna see that reduction uh, in flow going further downstream by storing the, the difference uh, into those lakes and the systems. Uh, same thing with Silver Lake and, and as we come down, we get into West Lake and, and you can see that we have much larger flow coming into the system, obviously because of more drainage area, but that, that also again, this amount of excess is stored in the system the resulting would be a smaller flow hydrograph going, leaving the system. Now in this particular one, by the way, you see two hydrographs here and, and these are alternatives we looked at, uh, looking at a more efficient outlet and less efficient outlet. I will talk about this a little bit further, but wanted to see that, uh, you know, essentially we are talking about the same type of impacts uh, regardless of uh, if you're in summertime or, or, or not summertime. Again, I'll talk about this a little bit. But when we talk about this system absorbing and system keeping the water, where is this at? Well, obviously these are in the floodplains where Bob told us. And those uh, 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 lakes, the floodplains around them and those muck areas. And, and unfortunately, what that means is that if we were if we built in those areas, if we developed in the past our, our homes or businesses in those areas, now we are seeing those areas getting uh, flooded because that flood plain is being accessed uh, by those higher flows. 
And you can see here those uh, areas shown in the orange overall in the watershed are areas where we actually have homes or businesses in those floodplains. And, and so uh, uh, as the system responds to rainfall, every time it occupies those areas. Uh, and so if you are in there, in those areas, obviously we gotta get impacted. Uh, now we are seeing uh, uh, a, a higher lake levels, I would say more sustainably than before. And, and again, that is the storage that we are following. And so here is number of days that, you know, we have a long-term station in, in Waldron Lake. So we are showing that results. And this shows the number of days that lake level was above the, what, you know, was you know, uh, set up as a legal lake level, which is the minimum lake level that, that wanted to, keep, to be kept in the system. Uh, you can see that we are seeing a really significantly increasing trend uh, particularly in recent years, uh, in terms of number of days that these uh, lakes were high. And, and, and particularly in 2019, of course, this had happened before uh, in, in uh, 80s, late 80s. Or, uh, but what you're seeing is that in 2019, for 270 days uh, of, of the year, uh, a large number of days, we were above the legal lake level. This is almost two thirds of the year. So. Uh, What's happening when we look at the system closer, we see that is the lake levels, if the lake levels were high and you have subsequent rainfalls, you know, following, it's the, the lake levels is, is has a harder time to uh, basically come back to its normal. So it, it's just, you know, uh, consecutive rains that causes that, that to be staying higher and higher. And of course, uh, this tracks very well, which was a graph I showed earlier about number of uh, extreme precipitation events and 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 that's what we're showing that this is this increase kind of a, kind of tracks with this one here so that's what the that's why generally we see these changes now uh, we have been uh, noticing and looking at the west lakes chain system itself in terms of uh, how the gauge height on the lake relates to how much flow is going, leaving the system. We are tracking this, the, the flow uh, going through the Casper wheel gauge. We're looking at gauge height at Waldron Lake. What we're looking at it is the relationship between those areas. All the orange doubts here are the kind of a more of a uh, growing season, summertime kind of a uh, relationships. And the blue uh, dots here are looking at uh, non-growing season, September to April. And what this graph shows us is that for the same flow leaving the system, we are, in order to be achieving that one, the lake level rises in different amounts. We can see this very variable, and you know, it could be lake level could be six and a half when you have 200 CFS, or it could be nine if you have 200 CFS. So this is uh, different. And why is it different? It, it depends, of course, of many, many factors. Where is the situation, the groundwater? What sort of a flow preceded uh, that event? Uh, and of course, here, as we are showing, perhaps the growing season has something to do with it because we are generally seeing in the mid range that within the growing season, we have a larger lake level uh, for the same amount of flow passing through the system. So to, to we do acknowledge that there is some differences, although in not all the range of the flows, because in the upper ranges, we are not seeing that. However, the question in our mind is that more than even what is causing this is what kind of impacts does it have in our system and can we put it in the context? And so what we did, we looked at, first of all, summarize those dots into what we call a rating curve. Uh, so you have this orange line representing those summer uh, relationship that we're seeing generally in the summer months. Uh, again, remembering there was a lot of variation, but we are trying to have an average condition here and an average condition of non-growing season. So you can see again, as we showed before, that generally if you are in that different type of season, uh, that you are seeing the higher stages. Now, what happens, what is the difference uh, in, the up, in, in the performance? in terms of when the water goes through these lakes. And you can see that uh, in this graph here, 
what we have is that we are simulating uh, using either of these two graphs of, of what the flow would look like. And, and the, here the, the solid line, it, it looks at those stages in the summer months. If we were, if we had, if the outlet looked like that when we were, in, when that flood came through, and this one here, the lower one shows if a more efficient outlet was available or in effect when that flood came true. And the difference really, as we look at that one here, is we, we uh, is in the order of a half a foot uh, for the peak. And we are seeing that perhaps instead of a uh, 20 days uh, of uh, inundation at, uh, in, in a, of higher stage level in some point, and we're gonna have uh, maybe uh, in, in, this, in this extent here, three or four days less uh, at, around the peak when maybe two or three days less. So bottom line of this is that, is, does, it make, does it have an impact? Yes, uh, uh, and, and how is the impact? The impact is, is not significant if you consider the number of days that we are above that level, or if you consider what is at stake here, uh, most of the flooding that we've seen in this area uh, for most homes are, are uh, three or four feet or two and a half feet. And now we'll talk about that just a second. So given that system, what we're looking at is, can we do anything about some of the things we, we can do? We talked about the, the uh, outlet efficiency and, and uh, you know, it's not as clear exactly what's causing it, but even if you're able to, to remedy it, we saw the results were not significant in terms of changing the picture uh, of, of flooding. Uh, what about storage? What about additional storage? So we did look at additional uh, storage in the system. We said, what about if we go really put super big ponds in, in like those five major sub basins that, uh, you know, come into the system. And so what we did, we simulated that by putting a 600 acre feet of flood storage, very large storage, given the groundwater is so high in this area, say we, have, we assume that we can maybe get two feet of active depth of storage above, you know, above the, the low level of groundwater. And so if you do that, one, we have, we almost always, each one of these lakes should be over 300 acres. Of course, these are uh, 300 acres of agricultural areas or whatever it's used in, in forested areas. So, you know, let's theoretically be talking, okay, let's, let's say we were able to do this. And if you do that one, generally uh, our cost estimates of, of being able to provide something is about $100 million. Now, what do we get for that $100 million? Even if we are able to do that, what do we get for it? And so we simulate that system. And you can see the results here, you know, we show that in the, for Indian Lakes uh, system. Uh, if we provided all those lakes, uh, we were able to, reduce the elevation by three and a half inches uh, and reduce the flood duration by one day. The results is for 100 year storm. We also simulated five year storms and maybe instead of three and a half inches, you will have six inches or instead of one day, you may have three days. But that's the difference. Uh, in Westlake stages, uh, now we do have some information about the uh, uh, kind of a, where the level of homes are. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Rodney Renkenberger. Uh, as part of the work he did earlier on, he had kind of catalog number of homes around those lakes. And so we, we, we know something about it. But, but here again, the peak flood elevation is only reduced by two and a half inches and reducing flood duration one day. Now, when we look at average flooding depth in this area, 60% uh, of those houses, about 300 or so around these uh, West Lakes chains, 60% uh, of those are uh, receiving 30 to 40 inches of, of uh, uh, flooding if that 100 year uh, storm occur. And about another 80 or so structures are have a two and a half feet of flooding. So when you compare that numbers with that two and a half inches, that's why we're saying that that's, that is not a significant uh, game changer per se, even if you spend $100 million. Now, the two uh, bullets I put in the bottom with the red, is really something we need to think about. So we talked about climate change. We know that elevations are going to increase somewhat. So what we would gain perhaps by 
uh, you know, even even if you're able to do those ponds, is that climate change may take away in short distance. And also groundwater influence is significant to reduce any potential benefits in this particular system because it's not a runoff derivative system. As Bob pointed out, only about 20% of this rainfall uh, ends up in, in the runoff. So we don't really have a control over the entire uh, rainfalls that are coming in here. So the question becomes then, then uh, uh, what we do is let's just summarize our findings before we go to recommendations so that you're on this all on the same page. Uh, so Bob did the site assessments and the result of that looks like telling us that North Branch Elkhart River uh, system main stem is remarkably well stable and very well connected floodplains. Uh, so of course, great care should be taken not disturb the system because that really uh, triggers a, a, a chain uh, reaction that would undo that resiliency that's in the system. We estimate about 80% of the flow in the river is supplied by the groundwater, very significant, uh, um, important factor that you know, uh, tells us that the type of the strategies in this system could be different than your normal system. Headwaters in the, around Kendallville uh, looks to be degraded. We see significant erosion, uh, and uh, this is resulting from stormwater inflow and, uh, and, and the channel shape, which is now the V-shaped and, and just a typical uh, dot channel. Uh, and, and, and a lot of places we didn't see any function of floodplains. However, how the headwaters, you know, in downstream of the Kendallville, uh, uh, you know, while they were modified by sand and gravel extraction, we see opportunities to be area. As we go downstream of the Sylvan Lake, we see that that Sylvan Lake is functions as a buffer uh, between upstream and, and downstream. So if you're, those people in the West Lake should, should feel very lucky for Sylvan Lake to be there because now it's buffered all the impacts of those uh, basically a, a ditching and, and uh, uh, things that happen near the Kennewell area. We talked about average annual rainfall that has been increasing and expected to further increase. Uh, number of extreme events, rainfall has been increasing. Uh, one thing I failed to show you is that, you know, when you look at that trend, that was happening up to now. Uh, what we expect to happen in the future, nobody expects that trend to reverse itself. So it's gonna be higher and the debate is how much higher. And so this number of extreme rainfall events uh, definitely is gonna be increasing. Average flow volumes downstream of the lakes are not yet increasing significantly. Uh, and we attribute that to the extensive storage, which is in the system and that groundwater connectivity uh, and ability of the basin to absorb those rainfalls. Uh, so large amount of flood storage in wetlands and lakes in the watershed obviously creates that, that resiliency. Now we have several homes built in the floodplain uh, they will continue, unfortunately, to be susceptible to flooding and to experience more flooding. We did look at, can we change anything in this system? However, unfortunately, we find out that even if we are able to, uh, you know, mass, you know, $100 million worth of additional major flood control ponds, that reduction is not going to change that outcome. Uh, so we're going to continue seeing that flooding. So. Uh, that is a significant, that would drive what kind of strategies we will have. The West Lake outlet efficiency appears to be generally lower during the growing season. Uh, and aquatic growth uh, near the outlet could play a role. However, during the storm events, the result of this inefficiency is only on the order of magnitude of inches and a uh, few days in higher status. So the main uh, again, with the main causes of this inf in inefficiencies, uh, need further uh, investigation. We suspect that groundwater is also playing a role. There is a different kind of a change in the aquifer system right uh, downstream of uh, uh, West Lake, you know, Waldron Lake, and so that may enter a, a, an influence in the system. So it needs to be looking at it further in that one here. But one, one thing we know is that the level of the lake before the storm uh, is, is a big influence on the peaks and duration of high water as we see it. Uh, so an increased frequency of rainfall 
causes these lake levels to be staying higher longer. Uh, in this system, preserving the existing floodplains, wetlands, and lake storage capacity is of utmost importance to keep the system relatively healthy. And here's what I'm highlighting in this particular slide. You know, immediately when we know these findings, when we look at this, ask our question, what are the most important things we can do in this system? One of the most important things we can do in system, first of all and foremost, is to prevent things from getting worse. I have talked about this before, and several of you have heard me before in saying that, uh, you know, this is exactly how, uh, you know, the firefighters approach the wildfires out west, is to isolate the, isolate the issues. If there are issues, let's isolate them. Let's have a fire break so it doesn't expand any further. And this is the same thing here. In, in other words, if, if the system is, is changing, if, if we are seeing flooding, uh, can we, uh, we should be doing everything we can to prevent this from getting worse. That means to preserve those, any remaining wetlands and uh, upland depressional areas. Here in this system, we are lucky that many of those systems are intact. Preserving the remaining undeveloped floodplains and not allowing disturbance on the floodways and the FEH corridors. I will talk about that later, but keeping those morphological floodplains attached, not doing what we have done uh, in the past in the Kendallville area. Uh, what we can do is to not allow adverse impacts as a result of new urban or agricultural development. As new things happen, we need to be adopting no adverse impact development standards so that we make sure that things are not, uh, there's no negative impacts as a result of projects. Uh, project impacts sometimes happen from drain drainage activities as well. These are drainage, you know, improved drainage activities in the watershed. We need to be thinking about compensating those uh, measures that, that address those and remembering that potential uh, climate change impacts when we are doing the permitting projects. Another major thing we can do is to adopt those smart growth resilience strategies. So that's type of a big picture type of things that can be done in this system. And I'm gonna, based on that, go to our recommendation. Our draft report, which is out right now for review and within the team members, uh, we are looking at some recommendations. Basically, what we're looking at is that because we have no feasible option to reduce flood levels and prevent the, what we have, a groundwater-driven lake chain, you know, preventing that system from occupying this floodplain from time to time, we need to be thinking about adapting, preparing, and ensuring that actions are taken to prevent matters from getting worse. And so, the report lists several recommendations. Uh, the major recommendations, uh, developing adopting flood resilience strategies, updating stormwater and floodplain regulations to make sure things that, you know, uh, new development is not impacting anything in the future, encouraging consideration of drainage impact mitigation measures. Uh, if you don't understand a little bit better the interaction between surface and groundwater, considering initiating additional studies and models to better understand that system before we can we, we, we go and make changes if we think, it, it, you know, we, we better understand the system because we may realize that some of these uh, measures may not have as, be as impactful in the system. So we need to be studying that. Preserving the existing USGS gauging stations, commissioning additional gauges, uh, adding a half a foot of freeboard to the state required to feel freeboard when we did some analysis and looked at some historical data and we feel that you are better served by adding at least a half a foot of freeboard to your to your freeboard because the, the system is changing and, and you're gonna see higher floods. And finally, maintaining periodic communication outreach with stakeholders. So I'm gonna highlight three of those main uh, recommendations in the remaining slides and, and so that we can just get into it a little bit further and what is exactly we're talking about. Uh, we talked about adopting resilience strategies to keep, keep things from deteriorating. And, and, and we have found with working with different communities that one of the most efficient ways and one of the most effective ways to look at system and implement these strategies is to basically divide the system into pieces have different strategies for different areas in the watershed because they are really have their own issues and problems, unique problems and unique uh, characteristics. So 
as you can see here, we are dividing the system uh, or, or area here of interest into uh, six basically segments. The first one is river corridor impact areas. These are areas that are either in the floodway or erosional corridor of streams. By the way, some of you uh, uh, may know already that the entire uh, state of Indiana rivers and streams uh, it has been, have been mapped for erosional corridors around them. So we have erosional corridor everywhere and there are in the DNR hosted these areas. So those, these areas are already determined. But we have areas that are impacted by, by move within the river, by the erosion uh, potential. Then we have floodways as you're familiar with already. So area which is bound by both floodway, either you know the largest area of floodway and or the erosional corridor, we call it impact areas. These are areas where, uh, you know, really in terms of uh, conveyance, in terms of erosion are significant because when you do something within this area, it impacts other very significantly. So the intention of strategies in this area is to uh, basically preserve these areas and do not disturb in, in these areas. Uh, the second major, uh, 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 district, if you will, or, or zone, is this undeveloped high hazard flood storage areas. Now, these are the remaining areas in the 1% chance floodplain, which are open right now. So these are acting, these areas, of course, are acting as storage areas and, and the remaining storage in the system. And, and, and the significance of them, it cannot be understated. You know, uh, it, first of all, they're, they're habitat improvement in your system these areas are those uh, you know flood panes that or, or you know muck areas as well in these areas and wetlands that are just associated with this river these areas are providing very valuable service to everything downstream of them in this particular case look at this area which is shown in red these are where a portion of the flood pane where the homes are built into stuff like that and this storage is keeping keeping the rest of this area to be in the flood pane. So the storage, to, you know, the intention of these strategies in this area is to preserve that storage and, and to try to, to, to minimize any impact on that as well. Then we have this uh, uh, vulnerable developed areas that I talked about. This area are where the homes are already built, businesses are built within the, these, these high risk areas. And so uh, our strategies should be different. The strategies here is that to protect people to, uh, to, to reduce the pain and suffering, to reduce the damages as much as we can. And so the strategies for this section, for this particular segment are, are unique to that type of a uh, intent. You also these, see this moderate flood hazard areas. These are areas within the 0.2% chance flood plain, uh, or 500 year flood plain as known. There are several studies that have been done by Notre Dame and others that show that these are our future 100 year flood plains. Again, these are probably those, one of those areas and those mock areas that Bob talked about. So these are, are, are where, the, where the water level, as it rises, it would try to occupy those. So intent of this area is, is to be careful when we develop in these areas and, and uh, try to preserve them as well as much as possible. Very, very important zone of this multi-zone approach is what we call safer areas. The safer areas are areas that we should be encouraging development. The resiliency strategies are is all about encouraging development, not to, 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 to keep it from happening. But we need to be doing this in a sound way. We need to do it right. And so the safer areas indicate areas that are outside of those uh, uh, flood uh, risk areas. And so, so in, in our, the intent of strategies in this area is to encourage development, to make it easier to develop. And I will talk about a few of those specific strategies that could be considered. And lastly, the entire watershed. The watershed is what, as Bob pointed out, uh, gives us all the, uh, you know, the, the introduces all the, the flow sediment into the system. So if we are, uh, you know, whatever we can do in the watershed to keep that water from running off, from, from retaining, infiltrating it, and, uh, you know, doing things in a, in a more uh, coordinated way 
basically helps the, our system in there. So the watershed is also the last zone and there are strategies to, to implement within the watershed. Uh, so delving a little bit deeper into this, uh, what type of strategies are we talking about? So in the river corridor areas where we talked about where these areas are the, in the floodway or, or fluvial erosion areas, uh, some of the strategies to consider is to adopt a river corridor impact area overlay zone and prohibiting any, any development in this area. Now the floodways are already delineated, but not erosional corridor. So combination could be added as a layer. Also, if you are able to perpetuate this protection of these devel undeveloped areas, regardless of laws and uh, politics, uh, we are better off in the system. That can happen by uh, partnering with the land trust, such as NRCS or others, to put some of these areas in easements or, or maybe you know, purchase them or keep them. Uh, when we see some of these areas are impacted, such as what we saw in the Kendallville area here, uh, restoring those impacted corridors uh, into uh, using the nature-based solutions becomes important, you know, such as two-stage ditches or other uh, fluvial erosion hazard mitigation. We actually have a manual for the state of Indiana of how you uh, basically do sound protection in these areas is needed. Uh, for undeveloped flood, uh, flood storage areas, high hazard areas, uh, some of the strategies that can be adopted include reserve, you know, uh, preserving those floodplain storage functions by prohibiting or strongly discouraging new development in this area. So we have a couple of counties, Hamilton County as an example, totally uh, basically prohibits any development within the floodplains, any fl filling the floodplains. And that's because they want to preserve their, their other areas in the system. They don't want to see additional flooding. Uh, if we have to fill in these areas, uh, but so for some reason, a bridge or some sort of a you know, critical infrastructure, uh, something uh, we need to put in there, uh, which have to be in the floodplain, uh, 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 then we need to find a way to compensate for them. Now, uh, the compensation ratios uh, uh, used uh, sometimes one-to-one, -one, but we definitely need higher compensation ratios to make up for lost storage. Again, perpetuating the protection of developed areas, undeveloped areas is important through partnering with land trust and uh, also very important in these areas that if you have to have a hospital, if you have a fire station, something that is critical use, uh, we should be prohibiting development of any of those things within these floodplains because that, you know, when the flooding occurs, that's exactly when you need these services. So these critical facilities need to be put in a, in a higher uh, land areas. Now we do have this uh, vulnerable developed areas. These are areas that have been developed. This is what's happened before. I want to think about it as a legacy issue, hopefully. But what do we do here? Uh, well, we have a slew of possible strategies that could be uh, put in place. Uh, first of all, we need to be protecting any existing critical facility in this area. Uh, we had this situation in some of the areas. I mean, like the, you know, uh, as an example, city of Columbus, Indiana had the a, a, a hospital built in areas that are now high hazard areas. So, you know, could be flood proofed by ring levees, those things that cannot move. If you cannot move a hospital, you can at least flood proof. When we can move areas, relocate area, we should be relocating or buying out uh, homes and relocating our areas. Or uh, if, if that's not desired, then at least to be able to flood proof or elevate. Uh, those homes and businesses. Uh, there are risk, other strategies that can be taking place in this area, such as to reduce the pain and suffering, such as raising the utilities up and some of those things. Also having developing flood response plans. I know that Mick Newton has already put together some flood response plan for some of these areas at least. And so those flood response plans recognize that that flooding gonna occur now, how do I do it so that so that we are staying ahead of it. And encouraging flood insurance and participating in CRS are among the strategies that can be appropriate in these areas. For the moderate flood hazard areas, uh, again, discouraging new development in these areas, requiring buildings to have a freeboard equal to that greater, equal or greater than, than that called SFHA. A lot of times we see, you know, because of what we need the freeboards in the 1% chance floodplains, right? Then we come just the edge of that floodplain 
you know, we go to the 0.2% chance, the homes are not required to be raised. And that creates a, a disparity there. You know, floodplains, of course, don't understand the lines very perfectly. So a uh, strategy could be to also require the same sort of freeboard as we go to is 0.2% chance areas. Uh, in the safer areas, uh, we need to steer public policy and invest investment into the safer areas. What kind of things can we do? Extended sewer lines, extending the water lines, ex you know, constructing infrastructure. Even many communities are thinking about tax breaks or incentives to, to push the development in that direction that's safer in the long term. And when we do develop in these areas, uh, think about conservation design, LID and green infrastructure because we want to keep the water where it is so it doesn't come uh, contribute too much to the uh, floodplains. Promoting placement of critical facilities uh, in safer areas is also another strategy. If we have a critical infrastructure, this is a good place to put it. So finally, the watershed, uh, you know, partnering in watershed wide partnerships in, in this basin, you're uh, lucky to have the Central Basin Commissions, that Central Basin Commissions can help uh, bring the, you know, different counties and different entities within this watershed to uh, help them perhaps have a more uh, consistent uh, ordinances or apps type of a project that we're talking about here to have those uh, kind of a more watershed wide approach. Encouraging uniform, no adverse impact stormwater standards in the areas, supporting USGS gauging stations, adopting natural resource overlay zones so that we can preserve those wetland depression areas, uh, type of things we can do in the watershed. Also promoting use of cover crops, soil health practices, reducing impacts from uh, surface draining. I talked about this and I will talk about it a little bit later. Also uh, associated with those drainage uh, way improvements. And then of course, promoting master planning and regional detention facilities consideration in these areas. So this type of resilience maps that we, uh, I just talked about, we developed this for the entire version. So we have about 40 or so maps that are gonna be part of the report, 11 by 17 picture, exactly showing what areas we're talking about. And in theory, an example of it. So for each one of those panels, we are showing what are these different zones that we have strategies for, where are those things? And then these can very well be uh, uh, so that if you adopt those zones and the overlay zones in your ordinances, you know, those areas are already predetermined. So you can see again, the same type of a uh, red areas being those uh, developed high hazard areas, a pre, you know, those storage that need to be preserved, so on and so forth. So yeah, here's an example of- yes. Can you use the term freeboard a couple of times? Could you explain that? We had a question about uh, whether you could explain freeboard. Yeah, the freeboard uh, is a term used in uh, to signify a, a basically a safety factor, perhaps. So we have, uh, in, in the case I used it, was that we have base flood elevation, call it 100 year elevation. And what we do is that instead of when we want to build a building or something, instead of building at that elevation, we're gonna, in, in state of Indiana, requires a two feet of the safety factor saying that because of the unknowns and uh, into calculations and, and other uh, impacts that we need to give ourselves a cushion. And that two feet is, is what we call freeboard. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, in terms of resiliency strategies, uh, I was going to give, give you this the example of these maps. There are 40 of them for different areas. This is an example of one in the Kendall area. Bob specifically talked about this area here. And so as we talked about this, in these areas where development's too close or erosion's too close, so we have seen parking lots and things in this area. So strategy perhaps could be to think about a, a attaching the flood pain through maybe two stage dish or something in the entire area here, uh, something to reduce the uh, uh, problems downstream. So these are type of things we need to be thinking about. Uh, by the way, before I, I, I move forward this, I showed all these strategies in these areas. How do we decide what is appropriate for one? Well, there's a process for that one. Perhaps a group of team can be getting together and looking what is appropriate for each area. And, and those are done through uh, looking very closely each area, looking at strategies that may be acceptable to the to the to the community, and adopting those. We, these these are done through 
uh, basically uh, resilience planning. Uh, we could soon do one within uh, near your watershed and hopefully uh, be able to see some of that example applied just close to you guys. Uh, we talked about updating stormwater uh, and floodplain regulations, which are uh, no adverse impact type of thing. What are we talking about? We're kind of developing those accurate watershed specific maximum allowable release rates so that when we put the detention is the right size, adding requirements for channel protection volume by retaining the first uh, portion of the rainfall there into retention, retaining those areas so that they're not uh, becoming runoff right away and adding requirements for no adverse, uh, uh, no disturbance in the floodways. Should be discouraging developing within the floodplains or requiring significant compensatory floodplain storage if those floodplains are being uh, occupied. And, and finally, adding and incentivizing standards for LID and green practices. Now we have several of these type of a, uh, standards and ordinances are in the different communities. Many, many communities have adopted those. Uh, soon we'll have LTAP would have also a, a, a uh, guidance or, or some sort of a uh, model ordinance that hopefully would talk more about this. We talked about the adopting same type of standards for new farm drainage and regulated drain projects. Uh, we have not been thinking about it that much, but uh, what we're seeing is that uh, this, this uh, a lot of surface draining, a lot of this, uh, you know, a, a, uh, kind of a uh, improvement that we do in the, in, the, in the drainage ways do impact what is downstream. So like the urban areas, probably we should be thinking about how to offset these things. Many communities are doing that. Tippecanoe County, as an example, uh, always before the drainage improvements, they're doing this uh, watershed studies and master planning and then coming with the regional ponds uh, that would basically try to mitigate for that increase. So examples of impact reduction measures in the farm level, uh, soil health conservation practices can be done to keep the water on the land and some of those agricultural drainage management structures. Uh, drainage boards can uh, think about, you know, consider two stage ditches perhaps for those areas and also thinking about regional detention ponds and these ponds uh, work you know, typically are offline, so water comes in, gets into the pond, and so the resulting water that goes back, it's a much smaller flow. And so basically, if you're increasing the flow downstream due to an improved ditch, we can keep some of that away. And so some of those strategies that can be implemented. With that, I'd like to stop here and, and, and uh, you know, open up for uh, Bob and I try to answer the questions as best as we can. So. Thank you, Siavash. Thank you, Bob. Thank you both. Um, I think the way we could best handle this uh, question and answer session will be to sort of use that raise hand feature and we can kind of go in order if folks have questions. We did have one uh, question that came up in the chat. I don't know if you can see that now, Siavash, or not, but I'll repeat it for everyone. Uh, that was a question from Dan Lash about what type of impact would placing in an obstruction downstream from the West Lakes in the stream uh, there was added in the early 90s a bridge which blocked all but 60 foot of a 240 foot floodway. What would be the long term impact of that in terms of increased sediment in the channel, specifically given the insignificant fall between the West Lakes and Cosperville? I know you guys have thought about this. Yes, uh, we actually uh, did look at that bridge and, and uh, uh, it, it's, 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 uh, the impacts of it is, is uh, kind of a uh, Doubtful, I guess, in terms of significant impact on the flood elevations. Uh, uh, we, in, 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 in total, uh, it, obstructions always impact, impact upstream areas. Uh, in this particular system, you have a really attached flood plains all over. So water, you know, even if you have a structures in the middle of the system, water may go still around it and go area. So the impacts upstream may be minimized, particularly if you have a groundwater driven system like we have 80% of the water in the groundwater, you can see that impacts are minimized. In this particular bridge, uh, what we have looked at, uh, it, it, it does not seem to have a significant impact on the upstream Now Bob may have, Bob was actually looking into, we're closer into it. And, and so I wonder what Bob, you want to add anything to that? No, Sivesh, I think you did a, a good job with it. In, in a a low energy system, 
like North Branch Elkhart River, where we don't have big flashy pulses of water coming down. Um, that, that bridge has big openings in it. Uh, and what it was it in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, additional structures were put on on the side to allow it to pass a hundred year event, uh, which by the gauge record, we haven't had for the period of record for the gauge. So it's passing through the water. We see no sign of obstruction. We don't see any sediment accumulation above it. Um, again, it's got a lot to do with the low energy nature of this type system. Uh, the fact that you've got the Waldron Lake system above it, you know, that that's, those lakes are the sediment traps. So the, the amount of sediment that it could accumulate down below uh, is minimal. Certainly nothing that's going to be obstructed by that bridge. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Siavash. Yeah, I think you saw another question come up, but I didn't see what it was. Yeah, Dan, Dan was uh, asking, you know, again, I think one of the things I was thinking about as you guys gave your presentation, see if I should spend quite a bit of time on two things. And these are two things that as I sort of, even as we got into this project, we were aware of previous studies that had been done, uh, namely the Silver Jackets report that was specifically looking at the West Lakes. And, um, you know, we did a couple things different in the way of wanting to look at the entire main stem of the North Branch. Uh, but we did know that there were two sort of lingering uh, questions from that West Lakes, or excuse me, the uh, Silver Jacks report. One of them was around the transition zone, so the outlet of West Lakes down to Cosperville. Uh, that a, a report, uh, the Silver Jackets, that is, you know, did allude to this uh, vegetation in the outlet zone and what impact it might be having. And Siavash spent quite a bit of time uh, sort of explaining what we do see in the way of data differences between the gauge at, on Waldron Lake and the outlet there. And I think that. Uh, Dan's questions are certainly building on that sort of focus on the transition zone. And, and so his first question was like, hey, you know, what could that bridge have done? Because we know this is a critical area. Is that like adding more weeds in the channel by, you know, by putting that structure across? But then in, in this question, he's saying basically, uh, you know, when the West Lakes did some efforts this year to remove weeds and as well as woody debris, uh, specifically in that transition zone, they seem to uh, experience immediate uh, relief uh, in terms of the, the levels going down. And Dan, you're by all means welcome to unmute yourself and, and jump in on this. But as I understand it, he's kind of saying, how do we explain that? Or, or has this study taken that into account, the experience uh, that these folks sort of saw this year in the way of relief? Yeah, yeah, I can jump in on this. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, you know, I've been living on the West Lakes for 40 years. Uh, when my grandparents moved in here, or my in-laws moved in in the 80s, and I moved in in 85. And so I've been watching the flooding issue for quite a long time. And of course, uh, the broken record is uh, we've always had flooding. The problem is, is the rate at which the floods recede once we have them. And uh, last year, uh, I know that the West Lakes Associated treated for weeds uh, in uh, towards the end of June, and we uh, and once the weeds died, we had an immediate relief from our flooding issue. I mean, uh, uh, the the water levels dropped precipitously uh, over a short period of time, so we could get on the lake once again very quickly. So that's why you know the folks on the West Lakes continue to focus on this transition area because we know. Uh, from first-hand experience, when that transition area is clean, uh, we have, we always have flooding, but the water goes down as it used to. And I'll mute myself, let you respond. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that comment. And I start with the respond and then uh, response, hopefully uh, Bob would follow. We agree. We saw the same thing you saw. We looked at the simulation and we do show uh, that if in some circumstances, if that, uh, if there's a weed growth that is happening, it, it, making that, uh, uh, yes, that has an impact. It has an impact. All we try to do is put that impact into a context, saying that you may see the immediate benefit uh, by, if, if so if the, if the flooding was gonna linger in two days, now you have one day, perhaps in a, a, a quicker thing. And, and it went down quicker, sure. And that's what the same, same result we saw when we look at it. But in the big context, uh, 
make no mistake, that is not going to change your, your uh, larger flooding picture. If, if you have a 2019 and you have 270 days of high level flows, that is not going to make that 270 days to two days. It's going to make it 270, maybe to 260. So continue doing those things that you can to uh, as the best you can, but make no mistake, this is not going to be changing this, the, the, um, the picture considerably in, 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 in significantly. So the amount of investment you make into it, the, the, how you communicate this is, is becomes important. We do not want to have a false sense of, oh, we, we go take care of weeds, you're going to get never flooded. No, you're going to get flooded, not only flooded, but you're going to get higher flows. Uh, and as we go forward, this is going to get worse. Definitely do everything you can to, to control those weeds. But it, the impacts may be limited. Bob? I, I think you covered the, the weeds well, Siavash. Uh, the, the, the causal relationship between and the correlation between weed removal and, and, and reduced flooding uh, in, in the near zone by a little is it, certainly there. I mean, we, we, we can see that. Uh, but as Siavash pointed out, in the so-called transition zone, we also have a change in, in groundwater hydrology, groundwater sources. And we change from one aquifer type to another. And the other aquifer type that, that in the literature is called a surficial system. Uh, in other words, it's a little bit shallower, has a faster recharge. It, it's, its rates of inflow into that area we don't know. We, we're poorly understood. So there's a lot of data that we don't have in terms of how that groundwater and surface water interact through that transition zone. Um, clearly for 300, 400 feet down below the road over near the outlet from the lake, that, that upper stream is, is, is more lake-like than river. Uh, but it's simply the ponding effect, because if you, if you remember those muck maps that I showed you, that lake could extend a long way down that way. It, it will flood. Um, so I think Sea of Ash is right. If, if taking out the weeds improves things locally for you, it, it, fine, good. Um, but I think the big picture is the flooding is going to continue. Lake levels are increasing everywhere. Uh, we've had increased precipitation and the frequency of those events is such. Um, the fact that you have been here since the 80s means that you have seen a lot of changes. It is not the same lake you lived on in the 90s, by no means. Uh, the graphs that CFS showed, those lake levels have been consistently going up and staying up long because we've been getting a lot of rain. And the more rain we get and the quicker we get it, the lakes don't have time to recede because most of that either has to evaporate out, infiltrate out, or flow through the channel. Uh, that connectivity is, is, is very strong. And Bob, I was gonna add here, uh, and there's also another ch uh, question in the chat about the uh, log jams and fallen yes. trees in that same river. Again, same thing. I think those, uh, first of all, you know, log jams, we do agree the log jams need to be removed. Uh, the log jams uh, cause local uh, uh, erosion around, around them when they are left there. Now, of course, the definition of log jams are really where the, the entire river is obstructed. Uh, and so uh, that need to be taken into account. Again, I, I like to say that these type of measures, you intuitively know that these, these work because you've seen it. You take the, the log jam off, you're going to see some immediate release, immediate area there. The, the, the thing we want to, uh, Bob and I, going to uh, bring into this thing and, and make sure that we understand is that our investments in the future, investment of time, investment of effort, investment of money, it should be proportional, perhaps, to the impact or to how these, these uh, type of solutions impact the big picture. Uh, if you have $100, if it's me, Sivash, if you have $100 to spend, I will spend $90 of it into what can I do to raise the homes? What can I do to do flood response? What can I do to buy out some of these homes? 
and then rest the ten dollars I pay for maintenance of those things, taking the log jams out and taking things. If you reverse that, you you are, we we are not helping you with these things. We are your consultant. We are trying to tell you this is what we're gonna do for it. Everything has an impact, but put it in the context. We you are uh, particularly in the system. You have to expect that lake level is gonna be high. So if your docks have to be higher, have to be higher. Eventually, that's what's going to happen. Eventually, those lakes going to hop, and then and living around those lakes may not be uh, sustainable at the end. Yeah. I think one thing that I saw in this present type, I've seen, you know, I've been on all these now, um, that I, I, I don't know that it really uh, answers Dan's question exactly, but it's certainly related, and that is, um, at what flow are we looking at or at, at what stage in terms of the uh, Waldron Lake gauge are we talking about when we see the impact from the growing season versus the non-growing season? And I, I know we had some discussion about which one to use in the presentation because if we throw in a hundred year event in our model and we look at what the difference is between the growing season and the non growing there's no difference. I mean, it, it's, it's but as we come down, you know, we, I think in the presentation you end up setting on, on a five year event you know, sort right. of like your storm, uh, you know, that's where we're looking at six inches and maybe two to three days. Uh, I would assume it's also possible that if we're down, you know, below, you know, a one year storm, I don't know what you call it, but just sort of, you know, normal high, high levels, I don't know, that, you know, not big storm, that the difference that the weeds would make. So let's assume that when that work was completed, and I don't know that that's true, but when the work was completed, the lakes were high, but they weren't like storm event high. Uh, maybe that, you know, you saw more like an eight to 10 inch uh, change in the elevation. I don't know. Well, actually, uh, uh, I can bring that graph up again and, and look at it and hopefully you can see that. But if, I don't know if you, I, I have looked at that graph several, you know, a lot of times. And so uh, I, can, I can remember it better than others. But in the low stages, actually, we don't see that difference either. So it's in the middle range, you know, in the middle low range that we see those differences. And, and certainly uh, the maximum that we see in, in terms of uh, change was about, you know, seven, eight inches. So, uh, yeah, that, but that, as I said, you know, for a small event, that may, may change the picture for the one day. Again, I don't want to take away from this bigger picture thinking, okay, we, we, you know, where we live here, do we have a, you know, the same way we have lived here before or not? I don't want to change that, you know, that definitely that's not going to be the same. Uh, now, even whatever you can do to, to make the situation better, do it. And, and we, we're showing that those are uh, important aspects. Of the work. I, I think that uh, one way this sort of um, watershed uh, has been characterized or, or in particular looking at solutions to what people are experiencing here is uh, one, do we you know, increase the efficiency of outlets? And so right now we've been spending a lot of time talking about the transition area, weed growth, log jams, the kinds of things that we would expect to make our uh, draining less efficient. Um, and I think that those are always of concern to watershed folks like myself because we have downstream communities. We've got a few folks on the, on the call now and that there's this sort of sense of, well, if we make all these uh, improvements in efficiency, um, what's the result downstream? Uh, but the other thing which, you know, this the study touched on and, and I think you hit it home and we don't seem to have a whole lot of questions coming up about this is what if we slow, slow the rate in and one of the ways we modeled doing that was building these giant detention basins and we see that even if we spent a hundred million dollars on slowing the flow in, we're still in about the same situation that we are. So you kind of can't help folks from thinking about, okay, well, then we're back to the improving the efficiency of the outlet and we're getting questions about log jams. I think they're, they're good questions and it's certainly going to come up on my conversations with my drainage uh, folks um, in, in thinking about that. Yeah, Matt, uh, I'm glad that you brought that up. And, and I think, uh, of course, Peggy's on the call. She can correct me uh, for everything I misspeak, misspeak, misspeak but... Uh, we did in, in the report, actually, we did look at, you know, give an example of, let's say the India Lake chain system decides to do something about their outlet and, and, and say, well, we're going to make this more efficient. 
that more efficiency means a uh, perhaps a uh, you know half a foot higher flood stages on the west lakes so because everything is related to one another so maintenance yes but drastic changes you're going to see that the downstream person downstream of you will will probably have you know have something to say about it because they are directly impacted so they, we are living in a system that everything relates to one another so so that's what's what's happening is that everything with time to take more efficient that means more flooding downstream and so that's just that we have to be careful what we do up there we got a couple of good questions come in see Avash, i don't know whether you see them there or not okay. but uh pete was asking at the mesic lake dam they normally add a board to the dam in the uh, spring early summer uh, and then remove it in the fall in coordination with dnr why add the board he asks good question uh i don't know the answer to that question bob or, or peggy no i mean they're, they're adding the board to hold the water level up a little higher for the for the low level for, low for the level. low level yeah for the low level i mean yeah it's the those, those are low water structures they don't do much anymore go ahead pete i see you yeah yeah if i could and i and don't get me wrong by these questions i'm asking as far as you know log jams and I think Dan's, you know, weed control and all that. I guess I call that low hanging fruit where we can talk to the lake residents at the board meetings and everyone's saying, Hey, yeah. you know, why aren't we doing more about, you know, I was at Delt church park and there's three trees down, you know, yeah. so that's kind of the simple, um, you know, uh, kind of a solution, but what you guys are saying, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket, pun intended, I guess. Um, but so we can continue doing that. The question there is, you know, the cost benefit of it. So do we put more money towards preservation? I get it. Yes, absolutely. My question then on the dam in your presentation, I think you made the point was, you know, if you get a heavy rain and the lake level is down, then the effect is going to be less, right? So why would we ever add that board anymore? Is that something dating back decades that, well, we got to put the board back in? Probably. That, you know, and I guess supposedly that's being coordinated by the DNR. So maybe that's a conversation we have with them. So uh, yeah, judging yeah. from your answers, you guys are shrugging your shoulders, maybe like, good question. I don't know why we're doing it. So yeah, well, I, 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 go ahead, go ahead Steve Ash. Well, I was going to say that the these, uh, I don't know specifics in this area, but normally I, I wish Dave Nance was on this call. He could explain to us, yeah. but uh, these lake legal lake levels were set, you know, uh, many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, I think through the court system. And at that time, they were looking at the average flows coming in, average numbers are coming in and trying to say, well, how do we keep the minimum from rising? And I think over the time, as, as we show, we see it in, in, the, in the gauges, that we are almost never achieving those, those lake level anymore. It's always higher than that because of the higher rainfall, higher lake levels up there. So I'm not sure how much value is there to that board. Maybe we're just doing it because we have been doing it so it's a good question for dave nance perhaps to talk to him about is that still relevant to do it uh, i suspect uh, knowing things from dnr that they're trying not to change th something to th don't get accused of oh you did it or something right. so whatever it was in the court system yeah. i i think that's a great point pete though in the sense of well if we don't need it we might buy ourselves a little freeboard you know to use the word that was defined earlier buy ourselves a little freeboard on some of these big events if we're already down a little further than we would have been with the board in yeah i see yeah, absolutely uh, and i think you you threw out the name dave nance and that's probably i'll make a call and just get that conversation going but i know that's one of those i get calls you know everybody's freaking out because the water's rising and says we need to take that board out well the water's over the the dam anyhow so it's like it's really not going to do any good so why don't anyway that's um probably a conversation with dave nance for starters on that yep and sure. uh well uh of course i don't know how west lakes feel about that but you know that's just that whole system uh what we do affects the west lakes and what they do helps us so it affects us so that's probably one of the most important things that the collective lake owners and inhabitants can understand is that given the groundwater driven nature of this system, anytime you do anything, 
you're affecting somebody else, even more so than a runoff driven system. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the vast majority of the water that's coming down into West Lakes isn't necessarily coming through the, the main channel of the river you're looking at. Uh, they're getting groundwater flow as well that's upwelling in the lake. And they are the lowest point. Now, they're the lowest point in that lake chain. But what they do then affects Ligadier. So everybody affects everybody else. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. We got we got a question from Ned uh, back on that bridge. Um, you know, you mentioned, I don't know if it was Bob or Siavash, that those additional passages were created to pass a hundred year storm on the sides. And because they don't get flow very often, I'm assuming, or because it's such a low energy system, as you mentioned, Bob, uh, it's real easy for those to get all grown up and everything. And so he was saying, uh, any, any thoughts on how to encourage the bridge owner to maintain those extension tubes or who might have authority or, or management responsibility for those? Is that county highway or I don't know? Is I don't know. I think it's a private bridge. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I, I, I think it, I think it's probably something he would do anyway. Uh, I will tell you that in all my times, Bryant, I've not seen it obstructed, but that doesn't mean it doesn't get, I mean, you, you've been there a lot longer than I have. Uh, but I, I think that's more of a conversation that this is important to us. Um, and much like you have on some other river systems, because the immediate beneficiaries might be the people upstream, maybe you say, hey, if this thing blocks up, can we come in and get it out? Uh, Matt, can you hear me? Yep. Um, with Pete Kelly, and the, and the water levels, we do not put our dam in until it gets to a certain point. Actually, the top of the dam is like supposed to be 8.55. We don't put the dam in until that. We just leave it open flow. Yeah. Um, it is right in right now because it did drop below the legal, I guess we're going to say the legal height that we're, we're, we're we are required through a uh, agreement with the DNR years ago to maintain the dam at a certain level. The water drops, we put it in. If the water's up, we don't have to all summer. You guys, what you're doing up there, yes, it impacts us, and we encourage you to keep doing what you're doing, and we're going to do everything we can do to get that water to flow through. Okay. The Bontrager Bridge, when he put that in, it's wider than the original bridge was because you can still see the pilings underneath. Mm -hmm. He went back in, and after, for some reason, somebody got a hold of him and said, you got, you, you lessened the amount of space. He put those two other tubes in, which I think they're probably 10 to 12 foot diameter tubes. At the time they were put in, that where the tubes were, water could flow through. Now it's silted in, so the water has to come up to a certain point before it starts flowing through the overflow. Is that making any sense? Yeah, it, it does, but we, we often, um, on those high flow tubes, and that's what those are, are we're required to be. D DNR said we need you to put in tubes that will pass the 100 year event. Um, so they raise those up like M Mickey Mouse ears, if you will. So they stick those up yep. above the main one so they don't silt in. So that when water level gets to that point, which would be the, the large flood, that those tubes are open when, and can pass water through them. So that's purposely done usually. I, I understand that, but I believe by just looking at it from the river, yeah, the uh, river itself being in the river and walking on the bridge, looking okay. at the tubes because of the weeds and everything, those are pretty well, it's got to come way up to get through there. It does, because it has to be that 100 year event. Uh, and as I say, by, by the gauge data that we have, you haven't had one of those. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, it's, they, they are way high. So in your opinion, they don't they do not need to be having maintenance done on them right now not from what i've seen no i i mean you want them clear and open I mean, if they've got weeds growing up in front of them that's not really going if it's a hundred year event it's going to go through them. okay uh, so weeds and things like that in front of them aren't going to be bothered um, well the, the trick would be is after a big event if you get something lodged in them then you need to pull that out 
Well, I think it, what Bob is trying to say is that I don't think that those tubes are effective in the low flow conditions. They're not. No, doing they're not. No, no, no. We understand that completely. Yeah. But we're trying to clear up a huge issue about the bridge is too narrow and it's. I'm, my my question is, and you've answered it. The tubes are made for an overflow. The bridge is doing what it needs to do for the river. Right. So. And is not causing an obstruction. It's not causing an obstruction. No, I mean uh, Peggy's on the Peggy's on the call as well. But when we look at the gauge data, I mean we don't we don't see you know we only have the one gauge there, but we really right. don't see a piling up behind there. No. So I, no, it's it's passing the water through. Okay, uh, that's that was that was my question. And no, again, I understand. It's it's. Uh, uh, you, you know, and Dan talked to me about that at the Indiana Water Shed Leadership Academy as well. I mean, as CFS said, you, you, you don't put something in the floodway without it causing some obstruction. It's some flow and it's some level. But that one's got big pipes through it and it's got overflow pipes on the side. So is it causing upstream ponding? Not that we can see. No. But we move on to whatever is causing the problem and continue to keep the river cleaned out as best we can so we have flow. We know we're going to flood. We just want the water to go through as fast as it can go. I know. And, and is, is the, the, the graphs that C of Ash was showing you, I think the most telling thing to understand is that this system is connected. And if you remember that long profile that I showed that showed the lake stacked up and coming down. Correct. In big events, the water is going to come from them down, down, and down. And so ultimately, it all comes through Waldron and West Lakes. Nancy just came on with the, yeah. could lowering the Mickey Mouse ears help. Uh, yeah, I'm no. going to say no, we're down to Cosperville. Cosperville is narrower than what we got there. Right. Really. So, and, and if, you, if you lower the mouse ears, uh, they, they, they still tick. <laughs> then you got to clean them out. Yep. Nothing's worse than right. cleaning out mouse ears. I mean, that's just not. <laughs> <laughs> cleaning ears never fun anyway. Never fun. <laughs> Thank Randy. you. Thank you very much. Anytime. Randy, did you have a comment? Yeah, I had gotten with uh, Dave Nance concerning that bridge and, and walked through the whole process. And uh, it, originally, I'm not sure that it was handled through a floodway permit, but subsequent to that, it was and it passed all criteria with the alterations that were made. So I know there's been a major concern about that bridge, but it has the flow capacity to be able to handle it for the position it is in the river system. Yeah. Thank you. So, so we've, we've spent some good time here talking about those uh, the one more so than the other, but the two things about, hey, what can we do to either increase the efficiency of the outlet or slow up the water that's coming in? Uh, and, and, you know, based on the, the slides that were shown and what I read in the report, not, not a lot. Not, I mean, you know, you could spend a ton of money, but you're not going to make a big impact on the gauge height. Uh, either way, doing either, either thing. Um, so understanding that that system is connected is really important. And then when we get to the key recommendations that I'm hearing, and, and you guys, we, we can have a conversation about this uh, more one-on-one, -on -one, but, but as I'm listening to this presentation now, uh, again, I'm thinking about those resilience strategies from a, a it, they make me feel really ignorant in terms of, I don't know what's already out there on the books. Like when you say uh, for the first area, you showed the maps and you've got your um, sort of river corridor impact area. That's the, the, the floodway plus the erosion zone. You know, this right. is, I'm this silly person. I, I used to think this way about wetlands too. Oh, well, they're protected. You know, the state's making sure no one's doing anything in there. And then the more you learn about it, the more you realize, no, these things aren't as protected as you thought. And so my question is, uh, you know, with respect to that, that high impact area, the river, you know, the floodway, it, is it already, you, 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 are you allowed to build in there? You can build in the floodway. Uh, you just have to get a permit to see that it doesn't impact the 1% chance floodplain. 
okay. so uh, water may still go above those parking area lot areas and, and that's a good thing you brought up uh, because i think it relates to the other ones uh, you know state of indiana has these laws for regulating the floodway for only one condition one percent chance flood that is not the same flow that causes your erosion necessarily this is for a, a high-end flood that would would uh, it's so they picked some some number and they regulated against this i think the local regulations need to do more than that they need to look at what happens in two-year flow what happens in five-year flow the abstraction and disconnection of the flood plains happening in the two-year flow levels two or five or something. So in that thankful stage, water cannot get to it. But once you get to 100 years, water is still going to do there. So maybe it's permittable for that aspect, but not into the impact of the, of the uh, flood pain disconnection. So my suggestion, and, and in those, that's why we're talking about no adverse impact standards, is to look beyond what, what the protection exists on the books. Those protections are not complete by any means. Well, and I, I think some of it is just for, for some of us, and maybe I'm the, the one that's the laggard here on this, but understanding what's on the books already. So I think you're speaking to the state level stuff, but when we're talking about the local regulation, I'm assuming we're talking about planning and zoning. And if we're not in a city, this is really not, you know, other than up in Kendallville or maybe, I don't know, I don't think Wolcottville's got anything like, like that, but we're basically talking about county level uh, yes. planning and zoning. Do you guys know, and was part of your study to look at what's currently on the books there? Like, is it is there med mitigation requirements now? I mean, I'm sure the, the folks from the, the planning office there in Noble probably know this stuff, but I don't. Yeah, we have, we have looked at those. And first of all, you're lucky. We have two good county uh, organizations here, uh, both Noble County and, and, and the LaBranche County do a good job on those ones. We have to make recommendation above and beyond what they have in their books in terms of some of those no adverse impacts to make it better. And, and some of these problems you see that also is comes from not before knowing some of these things, you know, so we don't really think about, we have our, most of our laws there for flooding. Okay, what we do is to reduce the flooding. What we're talking about now is, is the sediment and erosion control. A, 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 in the lower flow, ero, fluvial erosion type of hazards. And those require looking at the lower flow levels and that's, where I think some of our county ordinances could be updated to, to get it further on there. So they're, they're doing a good job with what they can, but we are we're looking at this system, we feel that there's additional things that need to be happening. So we have looked at those and we feel that there are good ordinances for most people. Well, you know, Randy would tell you that I think the Noble County Ordinance, I wrote actually that ordinance probably 30 years ago, I think 20 years ago, now it could, could be improved further. But I, I think it's safe to say that from your guys' perspective, like in my position trying to lead the commission, I mean, it would be really critical for me to, to know this stuff, to know what, you know, how do we make it better? I mean, you got to know what's, what's there to know what's missing. Right. But your understanding is, is we could. There's room to make it better. Randy, I see you. Uh, I, I guess I have a comment and a question to see Avash on that. Uh, in light of the changes in legislation uh, a year ago, uh, I was looking at changes to the Noble County ordinances of which he is correct. He, he uh, did a substantial amount of the work on that. And I was already looking at alterations on that. And in, then in light of the passage, and I can't remember the bill to save me, um, I kind of backed off on the idea because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if we open that up and make changes, then we have to make sure that they are uh, in, in a lot of ways no more restrictive, especially on the erosion control side, than what um, the state is. Well, yeah, I you. kind of backed off on that. Sure, sure. No, I, I don't think you should worry about that. That, that particular uh, uh, legislation stuff to talk about really only the, uh, uh, what you look at in terms of erosion control during the construction. Uh, how, uh, you know, what type of a, you know, issues and they have something that, okay, don't be restricted. But again, this, this updated standards ordinances keep that system the same. It's just, okay, there are, you know, uh, one acre uh, of disturbance. And if you go and say, okay, I wanna reduce that to much smaller or something, that's 
about that. It's about construction, uh, erosion, uh, you know, erosion control during the construction, but does not impact some of the things we're talking about. Well, it's a good question, though. Uh, that that uh, I think you guys should rest assured that that you can go have higher standards. The counties and cities do have the uh, zoning, uh, uh, land use control, and zoning control, and so only you can do something to change it. But you, your your hands are free for that thing. Thank you. That's a good point. I know. I now I caught up with what you're talking about there, Randy, you know, with the permitting around soil erosion sediment control. Gotcha. Does anybody else have any other questions? I don't see anything coming in through the chat. I really appreciate y'all being here. Um, we're hoping to get a uh, draft finalized by the end of the month and uh, we'll definitely be planning some kind of an open house to, to sort of discuss and once you've had a chance to digest everything. But I think these guys really did um, hit it home and. Uh, in terms of covering what I've you know read in the report, I think you 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 definitely hit all the the key findings and recommendations. So, um, uh, Ned and Diane, uh, I did hit record. Although I, I noticed I missed the uh, the introductions and all that stuff, but Bob was still on his pyramid uh, when I hit record. So we will have the 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 meat of this presentation will be available. I'll make sure we get it up on the uh, YouTube page, um, and I can send around a link. Uh, if you if you don't see something from me, by all means, just request it, and I'll I'll send you where it is. Um, so, I presentations. Why Pete had a question there? How available for for additional presentations uh, beyond that one more open house? Uh, these guys, uh, in fact, this came up at the last commission meeting. I had to. They have exhausted uh, everything that was in the uh, in the original proposal for for meetings. So. Um, I don't know. These guys are awfully, awfully generous. So if you, a phone call, I'm sure, uh, these guys will maybe address you, but to come to a lake association or something and, and feel free to take yourself off if you want to explain. But, uh, as far as formal presentations, we just have the one more, uh, as sort of a finale, uh, on this, uh, that they are committed to, but beyond that, it's on them. I'd, I'd love to see them up here in our basin anytime we can get them here. Thank you, Matt. That's, that's very kind of you. Um, but as to, to reinforce what Matt said, if if any of you have any lingering questions from something we've said, uh, something that wasn't clear, don't hesitate to call, send me an email, uh, and we'll get you an answer. Super. Thank you. I just uh, let you know that uh, at the very last minute, my computer decided that it's, it wants to regenerate its battery, so I got off, but I'm back in. I let you back in. I thought you'd come back in. <laughs> all right. Super. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And uh, I'll uh, hope to see you out in your part of the basin uh, here before too long. Thanks to all. Take care. Thank you.